What's up guys, it's your boy Damone and welcome back to another Epic 7 video. Today, I'm pleased to announce that we're going to be continuing the Tips from the Pros podcast featuring someone who is going to teach you how to build a successful defense. Also, a Hall of Famer for Season 2, Julian Z is known for having one of the highest defenses in the game. Guilds have literally set up kill lists on Julian Z to see if they can take him down. In today's video, you guys are going to learn some crazy insights that you might not have thought about when setting up a defensive team or positioning yourself in a way that you could become the best version of yourself. So when you guys are listening to this, just remember, have a pen and paper ready to go or pencil and paper, notepad, whatever you guys need to do to take notes. Obviously, if you guys are driving, please pull over after you pause the audio and then write down what you need to write down and then continue to get back on the road. But listen close because it's going to be a crazy ride and you guys are going to come away from this with a ton of valuable information. So without further ado, guys, let's go ahead and dive on in. Last episode, we featured Rec, who was the number one Hall of Fame for season two. And today we're going to be featuring Julian, who has a very unique take on how to actually structure your teams. What's up, Julian? How are you doing today, buddy? Very well, thank you. And thanks for having me. Glad to have you. So his favorite quote is that having a brain is more important than just pure gear quality. That balancing speed, survivability, and offense are the key to success. Let me say that one more time for you guys and get, you know, a gist of who Julian is at his core. He says that having a brain is more important than just pure gear quality. Balancing speed and survivability and offense is the key to success. So whereas when we interviewed Rec, Rec was more of like a unstoppable force who focuses on high offensive speed cleave teams julian is more the the immovable object and focuses more on defense and as he calls it people feeding him so we're going to talk more about that today and you know with it you know julian is going to bring a lot of crazy insights so make sure you guys pay attention you guys have a pen and paper and you guys are ready to go so julian tell me a little bit about what you meant when you said having a brain is more important than just pure gear quality i think building a team for defense isn't just you know throwing the best gear on each individual hero and then just hoping and praying for the best for me i think you know uh, having certain pieces of gear on certain heroes has to serve a purpose and a reason and that's what makes a defense so successful and I get what you what you mean by that, because, guys, you know, what you guys are probably looking at on the screen right now in the video is you guys are looking at Julian's defense rate. And for me personally, like I didn't even think that a defense rate, I, I didn't think it was possible to get a defense rate that high. <laughs> I blurred out the names just in case, but there were some some real high ranked people that are hitting Julian on a consistent basis, and Julian is just crushing it with his defense. What do you? What are what are some of the things that you think about when you're structuring your defense? My core defense at the moment is Rule A, Common, Crow, and Dizzy, and you know on paper it just looks like a very average crappy team that can be counted very very easily but you know i did a few tweaks certain aspects which makes my team stand out from the average joe so um for me like since since i am retiring from re arena i might as well give my insight to help you guys you know improve your defense because you know defense in arena is very very stressful especially when you're climbing on the last day most likely you will lose more points than you'll actually gain points i did a lot of trial and error in the preseason of season two and uh what really really shines is you know as i said earlier there has to be a purpose and a reason so i'll use my team as an example so rule carmen prowl and dizzy that was the very first team that i started and i believe when i used it for the first week or the second week the defense rate was around 70 percent it was very very high so why is it that high is because you know I carefully plan each speed of each hero for a certain purpose. So at the moment, most teams for defense are losing to Tammy and Iceria with two bruises. And, you know, Tammy Iceria is a very, very, very strong offense. You know, universally one of the best offenses in the game. What's going to happen is, you know, you've got to think, okay, so if I'm using Tammy Iceria, I'm going to kill that ruler first. For me, I think that resistance is kind of garbage in this game unless your resistance is like 100 or 200 plus like you know having 100 percent resistance is the same as zero resistance because you know there is no ice area that's going to run like 30 or 40 50 percent most ice areas in the legend tier all run over 120 easily so for me you know resistance is crap so they're gonna defense break it regardless so then you know 
I obviously put water origin on roulette. And then after that, uh, I, make, I make sure that my crowd is super, super, super fast. Because regardless how fast Dizzy is, it's not going to make a difference because of the cleanse from Tammy. Why does the crowd have to be really, really fast? Is that it instantly counters the, the Tammy, especially if Tammy doesn't have immunity gear. Every, every time she uses the S3, Crow will you know either push her back or taunt her because he's super, super fast. And that will easily disrupt the rotation. And after that, it's just game over. Wow, that's pretty crazy. So you're basically taking an enemy, enemy team strengths and using it against them. And you're positioning in a way that will allow your team to capitalize on any opportunity that the enemy team provides. Correct. Like when we first started talking, I was completely blown away. Like when you sent me the screenshots and you were showing me like your defense rate and how insane it was. And now talking to you now and how you position your team. Like I know you didn't start this way and I'm sure it took a lot of trial and error. So what did it take for you to get to the point in the game where you decided that, okay, boom, I want to be one of the best players in the game? So actually, I was in a very casual guild before I joined Ambition. And I was just having a nice time, enjoying the game. I was quite lucky with my pulls. I remember you know, I pulled ML Ken on my 10 out of 10 for uh, Storyline. And then I pulled Rule 8 maybe a couple of weeks later. So I was very, very lucky. Um, I was at the point of the game where you know I was just kind of losing a bit of motivation because there was nothing that much to do. Because I was in a very casual guild. And then um, actually the guild leader of Ambition at the time, Vane, he actually messaged me and he asked me you know, if I was interested you know, into, into you know, developing my skills uh, and then you know, be, see the competitive nature of um, guild wars and PvP. At first I was very hesitant. I was like, well, I'm pretty average. I'm pretty basic. I actually declined at first because you know, I wanted to make a better impression. So then I actually messaged him maybe two weeks later and I was like, hey, you know, I'm actually quite interested in the um, competitive nature. And um, yeah, and I joined. Um, when I first joined Ambition, the very first Guild War, I actually drew twice. Very, very embarrassing. It was very, very bad. You know, I felt kind of foolish, embarrassed, felt quite, you know, I wasn't angry with myself. I was just quite disappointed. And then, you know, we have this little joke in Ambition where if you draw, like, you know, constantly, you get memed, you know, just a little, like, nothing nasty, just having a bit of fun. So then I was memed quite often. I was like, you know, this kind of sucks. So I need to do something about this or else I'm going to be the laughing stock of <laughs> Ambition. Right. After that, I started, you know, planning and then to see what I really need to do to make my uh, PvP skills to the next level. Um, at first, no, as you said, it was a lot of trial and error. I was just a typical, you know, <clears throat> average Joe throwing, you know, random pieces of gear, like just super, super fast on like random pieces of gear on random heroes and just hoping for the best. And then, you know, that really didn't do anything at all. And this was also the very crucial part of Moonlight Araminta and Moonlight Bowl, just absolutely dominating the arena and i thought you know i had to think of something to counter both of those heroes i was actually really inspired by artorial and then how he used his units because he was one of the absolute unbeatable people when season two first came out and uh, he would have a you know, probably a defense rate of like 80 to 90 percent because wow. it was just that good everyone will, everyone would just feed him that's why i thought you know the average person would just throw a random piece of gear on Baal or harada and Araminta, um, because everyone would just build full damage for Araminta. He was the only one that built like full effectiveness, no crit, no crit damage, just speed and then full effectiveness. Because people didn't realize that Araminta, most of her damage actually came from the burns, not the actual pure meteorite. And people didn't figure that out for a very, very long time. Artorial was, was probably the first. And that's just an example of, you know, someone with like, you know, really, really smart play and then doing something that's different from the average person. So that's, when I, that's what really inspired me to become much, much better. So at this point, you decided to get serious because, you know, you're looking at Artoria and you said that Artoria was definitely an inspiration to you and you wanted to become better. What are a couple of the things that you started to do on your quest to defeat Artoria? So I started really, you know, just like having a pen and paper and just writing some things that I needed to do to be, you know, successful. I always try to do things that the average person doesn't do 
because that's what really makes someone stand out and be special. As I said earlier, um, everyone you know would make a quite quite a slow crowd with really really high HP. I believe I was maybe the first one to make over 230 speed crowd because I really thought that you know having a 100% upkeep on the defense buff was super super critical in the defense. And you know that was the first major breakout was having a super super fast crowd. I actually started out with uh, no HP, super high defense crowd because at first uh, this was actually very very successful because um, that's when I really started experimenting because a high defense crowd with you know 15 to 16 K HP triggers the S3 much, much faster. So that actually will one shot the Tammy very, very, very quickly. But then later in the season, people started getting much more, much more gear. And then we're just making a glass cannon Tammy I serial. They're making maybe 14 to 15 K HP Tammies. So that's when I actually had to adjust to the new metal. Because everyone was making, you know, 16 K HP balls, 17, 18 K HP counter dizzies. So the meta would shift very, very fast. Adapting fast is probably the most important thing ever. And also having discussions within the guild and then testing new offenses and defenses uh, with each guild member really, really helped out a lot. Got it. So let's let you know let's take it back a little bit so you, you mentioned that all right you you started to get serious you started looking at crowd you're testing with high defense you're playing with things and then the meta adapts you mentioned that as a player you like to do unique things because it, it allows you to stand out let's let's uh, take a second and really think about new players for a second so let's say i'm a new player and i'm just coming into the game and i also want to be unique and stand out what are some steps that I can take to build up my box so I can get to the point where I can build unique units and progress? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, have, I, have the perfect, I have the perfect answer. So you do something that will piss the offense player off really, really badly. Interesting. So, you know, the very, very simple, very, very simple answer would be, you know, you build a stall team. You know, you don't have to have Carmen. You don't have to have Ruler to, you know, really, really succeed. Like the most basic thing, you know, everyone has an Angelica, right? Everyone has an Angelica. You make a 140, 150 speed, super, super tanky, and then just chuck an idle chair on. And then what's going to happen is an Angelica with idle chair by herself can sustain for maybe three, four rounds just by herself, even if the whole team is dead. And trust me, the number one rule is if you piss the offense off, there's a very good chance that they won't ever attack you again. And that's very, very true. Because you're annoying and very frustrating. And, you know, something like an Angelica with an idle chair, everyone can do. And stuff like that, since it pisses off people, they won't attack you again. Very, very good chance they won't attack you again. So it's funny that you say that. So really just thinking about, okay, if, if, I'm, if an offense is going to hit my defense, what would make the opponent mad enough or bother them to the point that wouldn't attack me? Uh, what, are, what are some of the things that bothered you to the point that caused you to want to just be better as a player? Well, I kept losing to Dark Corvus, right? I would lose to Dark Corvus all the time. I'm like, well, Dark Corvus is probably the strongest offensive hero. Even though he's rated 3.3 in the uh, ratings, I think he's like so overpowered it's like not even funny. Because Dark Corvus is one of those heroes where you don't really need a defense. You might as well just have the white flag and just give up. So the only reason I got really mad was, you know, I kept losing. So what, how to beat Dark Corvus is very, very simple. You make them time out. You make them lose through uh, the defense damage the, from the system. So when they're ticking 2.5K, 3K, 3K, 3K over and over again, and they lose, or even if they just win, they will probably never, ever attack you again. So just making simple stalling teams, especially in the rush hour climb, goes, goes a very, very long way. So um, I actually changed my defense for the last... 20 to 30 minutes to something that you know, has no offensive power at all. It's just basically to stall so that no one will bother to attack me. So I actually make my defense Rulay Carmen, Rulay with Idle Chip, and then Crow with Aurorus, and then I put Momo as well. So there's absolutely no offensive power. But Momo has Rod and Rulay with Idle Chip. And I make sure that Crow has the highest attack so that when they attack Rulay, Crow gets pushed. So he's always having the defense buff on. 
And then even if there's a defense break or any sort of debuff, Momo will always cleanse. And then, you know, it's going to be a rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And then, you know, no one's going to attack that because it's so cancer. <laughs> I see that. It sounds cancer. And, and, you know, that ties into, you know, back into your quote where you said that having a brain is the most important, is more important than gear quality. So like really paying attention to the mechanics of each individual hero. So how are you going to respond or how do you think players should respond when Crimson Armin gets nerfed in September? So Crimson Armin for me, I feel like the biggest nerf is actually not the 15 percent because if you actually stack auroras with uh crimson armor's passive it's actually around you know, 40 to 50 percent damage depending on your armor and everything on that after approximate calculation it's, it's between 32 to 36 percent damage reduction so when you actually input the numbers not that big of a deal so instead of hitting 10k you're hitting 11k so it's not that big of a deal i feel carmen's biggest nerf would be the uh, S3, the immunity from three cooldowns to two cooldowns, that will actually hit people the most. Because, you know, Baal is dead. Baal was the number one reason why Crimson Armin was kind of meh, uh, because it kept getting uh, dispelled. So that, for me, is the biggest nerf from Crimson Armin, which is still okay, because they introduced the new, uh, the new artifact, which reduces damage by like 30%, something ridiculous. So Crimson Armin isn't a must, have but it will it'll be just nice to have and angelica would easily easily replace Carmen, even if you don't have common got it so for new players out there that let's say are worried that they don't have c armin or their c armin is getting nerfed what are what are some some heroes so you mentioned angelica are there some other heroes that you were thinking about maybe replacing your c armin with to still have a defense that would piss people off uh the most underrated hero i think in the game is currently Momo. I think she definitely needs a nerf. I think she's very, very overpowered at the moment. Um, and also, she's free. She's three stars. You can make her SSS very, very quickly. And she is probably arguably one of the best cleansers and healers in the game. So for all the new players, I would 100% recommend her. And her build would be you know, around 120 to 130% resist and make sure she's not too fast. You know, maybe around 150, 160 is all you need because you want the enemy to go first. You don't want to overspeed them. At the same time, have a nice balance between uh, survivability and speed and resistance. And if you stick a, t uh, a tome or a rod with her, she would be very, very difficult to kill. So you're saying that even when the heroes are nerfed, you know, being able to adapt and select heroes that can be just as effective is is basically possible for anybody as long as they kind of put the effort into it correct correct because you know uh you know if you have momo like you know a very well built like not does she doesn't have to be that geared but as long as she has the basic stats correct she'll be very very difficult to kill like you know a 12k hp you know 1.2k defense 160 speed momo would rod just in Guild Wars or Arena, like 3v1 or even 2v1, she's almost unkillable, to be honest, with Rod. So stuff like that, you know, for especially for a new player, that goes a long, long way. You know, it's crazy that, you know, with this insight, you're talking about how Motmo is just that strong and how she plays such a strong position. And oddly enough, like Rex said, you know, the same thing. He was like, Motmo is super underrated and that she's a very, very strong hero. Motmo, to me, like he, she strikes me as one of those heroes that are really, really good for progression. So if we had to go back to in time to, you know, your beginner progression and you were setting uh -huh. up because now you're like this guy who's a beast. Nobody wants to fight your defense. You have one of the highest, if not the highest defensive rates in Legend Arena. And for those of you guys listening, I'm not talking top 100. I'm talking top five, top three highest defense rate and a lot of you guys looking at the screenshots probably are still in disbelief so if we go back in time julian to when you're just coming up as a wee epic seven lad <laughs> what you know what are two mistakes that you made that if you can go back in time you would have took out of the picture so for me i thought speed was everything you know i had to get 260 speed i had to get 270 speed really you know speed is not that important having a very fast character over 230 is is already fine you don't really need to hit 250 260 to be that competitive because remember you're sacrificing speed for a lot of survivability and offense stats never forget that what i did was just having 
really, really, really fast team and just then just praying that the offense has a team that is a little bit slower than yours so that you go first. That was the number one mistake that I made. So basically having clever team for defense was probably one of the worst ideas I've ever done. <laughs> what I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just easy to count up. You know, you can bring speed imprints. You can bring, you know, a super, super tanky team with a lot of, you know, cleansing. And then as soon as the Cleave team goes after round one, they're kind of just dead. You know, they're relying everything on one round. After that, they're just obsolete. So that's what I did for a very, very long time. And that was absolutely horrible. So don't make that mistake. So the second mistake that I made was I thought that when I started, I would try to, you know, make a team very, very balanced without actually thinking, What's the purpose and why? And because of that, you know, I just made a team based off other people's experience. I used a team that like people based off, oh, this is, you know, like rumors to be the top defense or top offense. Everyone should use that. You should actually always try to do something that suits you and not just, you know, listening to others because, you know, what works for them would not necessarily work for you. So the biggest thing today is, you know, of course, I'm giving all this advice and tips but you should try to make it yours. Um, it's not, you know, what I say, everything is 100% correct. You should try to you know, take some of it and then make it yours and then adapt it so it suits you the best. That's pretty powerful, man. You mentioned that players could, you know, take a team and, and definitely, you know, because if you play with heroes and team compositions that you enjoy and you make it your own, like overall, the game is just going to be a better experience for you. So with these players, when do you think is a good time to really break away from just following what others say and start building their own teams? So when you can easily clear, you know, Wyvern 11 or Banshee 11, like, you know, when you can farm hunts all day and then you actually have a lot of leftover gear that you can experiment, that's when you actually should start branching off and making the idea is your own. I see a lot of people, you know, see this one defense or one offense. And then I see, you know, a lot of guilds just copy that offense or defense and don't really give any thought into it. One example is, you know, since the uh, Vildred Arbiter kind of got really, really buffed and um, a lot of people pull Fallen Cecilia, they actually put Armin, Crimson Armin, Fallen Cecilia and Arbiter and then one other hero, preferably maybe Dizzy or Bolt. They'll make that, you know, their key defense. But without actually giving any thought to it, they just put random pieces of gear on and then just hope for the best. So like in that defense, what makes a really big difference between great and crap is, you know, the positioning of the speed and the positioning of the S3. You have to time each S3, especially in defense, so that it works perfectly. I see a lot of people make really, really amateur mistakes. For example, the Crimson Armor and the Fallen Cecilia, you know, one is very, very fast and one is very, very slow. You should always take the advantage that when Crimson Armor uses S3 on the whole team, and then Cecilia goes next, you'll actually have another free round that has full damage mitigation. So some people just have a really fast fall on Cecilia. They use the ES3. And then, you know, your offense have, has a really nice AoE and then completely just gets rid of her damage mitigation. For me, I think that is a really, really big waste. And it's, you're not taking full advantage of your team's potential. It's crazy that you say that because uh, a, few, a couple of weeks ago when I was climbing the legend, I ran into a real strange situation where I ran into a Fallen CC and a Crimson Armin that was actually speed tuned together. And what had happened was the, the CC skill 3, C Armin skill 3. So then I tried to attack anyway. And what I realized was that the invincibility being up, now I couldn't take the scale nullifier off. Correct. So Correct. And since Arbiter is so squishy and can be taken out one shot by Lily, then you are the hero that has extinction. Imagine having Crimson Armin's S3 as well as Cecilia's S3 on Arbiter, which makes him, you know, super, super tanky. He cannot take any damage for two turns, and then he's just kind of like a god while he AoEs. So that is what makes a team great and what makes a team crap is your choice of gear, but not the gear quality, if you know what I mean. Got it. And that kind of takes us back to your quote about really just using your brain to think. And I think that, you know, a pitfall that a lot of players fall into is that, you know, they, they kind of don't want to make a mistake. So they just follow the tried and true path. So you suggesting that, you know, getting out of Wyvern 11 or after they have, you know, their team scored away and they're kind of ready to go, that that's the time that they should really start thinking for themselves. So let's say I was a new player, Julian, and all I did was I was like, you know what? 
I'm just going to do what Julian does all the time, every day. I'm just running what he runs. And then I finally got to that wall where that stopped working for me because I'm not Julian, so I can't do what Julian does. What are what are some of the steps that I could take to really start to branch off on my own? Every skill has like a cap or like, you know, where there's, uh, what, what do you call it? Where, yeah, so d- diminishing returns. So every hero in every sense that you have to research it yourself has diminishing returns. So for example, if your defense is over, 1.6k, 1.7k, anything over that has very big diminishing returns. So before you actually try to copy you know, a pro uh, top tier player, you have to try and cap the, uh, the stats first before you actually do anything crazy. So that's when you know, okay, so I've hit the wall, I've reached the hero's maximum potential, and after that, I need to make it special so that it fits my own. Basically, what I would try and do is, you know, I would try to cap out each stat to its full potential before actually branching out and then doing what you want to do, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. So what you're saying is just like you have to know how strong your hero can be or or how high the stats can go. And then from there, then you can just kind of play with it and kind of make it your own and see what you could do based on the team that you're trying to build. Correct, correct. So like I, I can make a hero example, say Charles. No, one of the best, you know, GVG heroes and also very, very strong cleaver. So not many people know that Charles has one of the highest scaling for his crit damage. And since even though he has a really you know, low base attack, unless you make his crit damage, you know, 250%, you know, you'll, you won't see any return at all. So you actually don't know your hero's maximum potential. If you just make him, you know, like 170, 180 crit damage with decent speed, decent HP, you're not going to see any return. You're going to see him hit like a noodle. All right? You need to understand, research, ask, and then you know, have proven resources why, and then to know your hero's limits before you actually start doing anything crazy and you know try to copy what I'm doing or what Rek is doing or anyone else is doing. I feel like that's a pretty significant you know challenge for the player base because we all want success and we all want to move forward in the game you know (laughs) no matter what that is how do you feel about some people saying that there's a right or a wrong way to build hero there's always many 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 builds to build one certain hero for example with the recent avatar a lot of people like to build him super super slow with maximum crit damage maximum attack some people like to build him really, really fast because they want to try to uh, take advantage of his focus. If he goes really, really fast, then, you know, maybe he'll revive twice. Something like that, right? But, you know, it's actually a lot of testing and then actually doing what you feel is the best for your current gear as to what other people think. So what I mean by that is in order to, you know, copy someone else, your gear has to be better than them so that you can actually adapt. Because not just Epic 7, but anything in life, if you just try to copy someone, you're only taking in less than 60% of what they're trying to say. And then that 60% you're trying to actually adjust and think, okay, how do I make that 60% into my own? So then you're actually missing 40% of um, the hidden stuff that he doesn't know how to explain or the 40% that you don't understand what he's trying to say. So then that's where you actually have to have your mind of your own. Because the most successful that are lawyers, doctors, or you know, businessmen that have a nice career, not only you know, they're just following what the teacher says at school and they graduate, but they actually really, really carefully think, okay, so, I'm in this I'm in this sticky situation. How do I make it my own? And when I'm doing this, what's the purpose? Why am I doing it? Back to Epic Seven. So when you're doing something, you should always ask yourself, what's the purpose? Why am I doing it? When I'm doing it, is it for good reason or is it just because someone told me to? That's the thing that you really need to differentiate. So for me, my guild members give me a lot of advice. From that advice, I could only say I maybe take in 30 to 40% of that advice because you listen to it and then, okay, how does that suit me? How does that you know, make me change? And if I do change, what's the reason? What's the purpose? Yeah, dude, that really means a lot to me because I... You know, I, I stayed in Challenger 5 for a long time because it was comfortable. And mm-hmm. I was like, well, I got to do something. So I realized, like, at the time when I was coming up, it was like the Cess Cleave was, was it. And I saw a video of Sky King, right? He was 
He was cleaving teams. And I was like, man, I got those heroes. And I built them immediately. I was like, oh, six star Celeste. I can get Sez going into play. But like you said, it's just like I was only taking in 60% of that. Even though he was having the success that he was having, with only 60% and trying to do what everybody else was doing, I still kept coming up short. And it wasn't until I had to make the adjustment and really think for myself by using even the small little tidbits I learned and kind of formulate my own team that I really started to climb an arena. Yes, yes. Uh, from that, you know, that's what really makes a person successful or the average. Like, it's, it's sad and unfortunate, but... The people who are successful, there's a huge gap between the successful and the unsuccessful because most people don't have a mind of their own. They just copy, 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 and never make it their own. You have to make it your own in order to you know, achieve greatness. Not only in Epic 7, but in life in general. Got it. So what you're saying is there's basically a limitless amount of ways that you can build any particular hero and team and probably even more ways when we start adding in artifact combination. Correct. I mean, who, who thought of making a no HP crowd when the damage scales off the S3? Because there are many, many times before you fight a crowd and that crowd never uses his S3 because he's either CC'd or he's just too slow. So, you know, I thought, well, it kind of sucks, doesn't it? Because you can easily abuse crowd. But how do you not abuse it is you make a really fast one with low HP, super, super high defense to survive, and which will always 100% trigger the S3. And that's what really kills people. And no one really thought of that for a long time. I thought of that, I thought of that maybe three months ago because I kept losing to Tammy Ice area. I wanted to uh, not, I didn't want that to happen anymore. Of course, that, that, you know, that back because I lose to Dark Corvus, right? So you have to make a nice balance because Dark Corvus is the most cancer hero in offense ever. <laughs> I hear that a lot. So like taking your experience and everything that you've applied to Arena, making literally one of the most, if not the most formidable defenses in the game, how does that apply for you in Guild Wars? So for Guild Wars, I'm actually not the best person to ask for Guild Wars because I do the most unorthodox creative plays in the guild and um for example you know everyone likes red blue green in a team because they think it's really really balanced i'm probably the only one in the guild that doesn't think that um i think you know balance is it's, it's good but it's very easy to be abused so for me you know, this is just my own taste i like it you know having two blues and the red so that when they use a green, the red counters the green, and then the blue is neutral. So stuff like that, it's thinking a little bit out of the box, it helps me succeed. But you know, I wouldn't really recommend it right now because you really need to outgear that person and really, really need to you know, have like a really deep knowledge of the game in order to pull that off. My ML can is quite special. Most people build you know, for lots of HP, minimal damage, high crit damage and a lot of resistance. I just go all out, 100% damage, no survivability at all. I rely on that one shot, uh, one tap on any hero. So like my moon like can is just all damage. So when he counters, you know, uh, he can hit, hit up to 30,000 to 40, 45,000 on a wow. armor defense broken. Yeah, so yeah, on a uh, armor defense broken hero with attack up. It can hit around 40k. People don't expect that. They're just like, okay, I'm gonna see, you know, ML Ken. I'm gonna leave him till last. He's gonna be really easy to abuse. And then when they attack him, <clears throat> they get one tapped, and they're like, okay, how am I gonna recover from that? There's no, there's no way I can recover from that. So the element of surprise, thinking out of the box, really catches people off guard. So that's what, you know, makes individual stand out. So what you're saying with Guild Wars is it still kind of boils down into kind of thinking for yourself and, and kind of figuring it out on your own and what works and what doesn't work for you. Now, you mentioned ML Ken quite a bit. Am I to assume that ML Ken is your favorite hero? And if not, who's your favorite five star ML or otherwise in the game? Actually, my favorite hero is actually Kral. Uh, I would say Kral actually carried me really, really hard. Um, ML Ken, you know, people, you know, think of ML Ken, you know, he's just, uh, he's, a, he's a five star melee hero, he's very, very sought out. But actually, in my opinion, he's probably one of the most overrated five stars for the Moonlight. Um, 
And Mel Kennedy is just, you know, he's okay for me. Like if I would rate him out of 10, I would give him a solid 7.5. Because on paper, you know, he looks amazing. You know? he, he counters every time it's crit. But when you actually think about that, that has a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of flaws. So if you make your Araminta and you make your ball no crit at all with a lot of effectiveness, ML Ken can't really do anything. Right, because you're not you're not going to have like 200 resistance on ML Ken because that's just not a very good build. But you will have 200 effectiveness, or at least 150 above effectiveness, for you know a hero such as Araminta or Bao, any light hero, right? Okay. With low crit, with low crit. So they're going to CZ him, they're going to stun him, and he's not going to do anything. He's just a sitting duck. So he's very, very easy to get abused. So ML, ML Ken, I think, is just a one-trick pony, the element of surprise. And after, you know, seeing him two, three, four, five times, no, he's just kind of like a dead hero to me. That's why I don't put him in my defense in arena at all, because he's just too easy to be abused. Got it. And you mentioned that, so with that being said, you said that Crow is your favorite hero. Why is that? Because if you build a really, really good crowd with the perfect balance of speed, HP, and defense, he's probably the most annoying hero ever. Even more annoying than Dizzy, which everyone hates. Because Dizzy, for me, you know, she's very easy to count. It's super, super easy. No skill involved at all. But for Crow, you know, you can't actually count him at all. If you build him correctly with the right stats, nice HP, nice defense, and you know, for me, I like him to be really, really fast. Because if you're going to use a green hero, you risk him S3 and killing one of your heroes. If he's really, really fast, there's always going to be a 100% upkeep of the defense buff. That's going to make the whole team really, really hard to kill. And then, uh, on, especially on defense, you know, it's just super, super annoying. Right? You see that the armor buff, and then. You know, you hit like a noodle. And then for offense, you know, if you can control and time your skills correctly, uh, arguably I think he's one of the best units in the game. All right, so speaking of, of favorite units, you mentioned, you know, ML Kin was like a 7.5 for you just because there's so many things that could go wrong, especially running a counter build if you build against ML Kin. And then you mentioned that Crow is your favorite just because he's probably one of the most annoying heroes in the game. And like you said before, when you think about teams, it's like, what would piss your offensive team off? Now, do you think there's any other heroes other than Angelic Montmorency that are overlooked? So for me, I think one of the most underrated heroes would be guided aether that probably no one ever uses that i actually use sometimes for killed wars and in the offense arena so guided aether has one of the hardest hitting s3s it scales insanely high like you can hit you know 50k easily if you know how to build it so she she's basically you know like a like a you need um she's very item dependent and she's also very team dependent. So if you see, you know, a rule that's really, really annoying. You want to one shot her. You know, you would generally, you know, use ox lots to pull guided aether, and then guided aether would be, you know, 4.5k attack, 300, 300% crit damage. She'll one shot the rule no matter what. Dead. Right. So people actually overlook her because they think she's a healer. And, you know, kind of doesn't really do anything. But actually, she her S3 scales insane. Even for, like, raid bosses as well. Like, if you do raiding, she can easily hit, like, 70k, 80k, 90k. You know, very, very easily. I think her uh, S3 outscales C doms a lot. But, of course, C dom brings a lot of utility. But I think Guide Aether, you know, has some insane damage. If you know how to use her. But, of course, she is very item dependent. But I think she's one of the most underrated heroes of all time. <laughs> Bro, did you just say 80k on Guider 8? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. If you, if you build her correctly, and there's a there's a defense buff on a raid boss, and you S3 with the, the attack up, you can hit like 80k. Jesus, that's insane. Yeah, she's so she's actually you know everyone overlooks that, but she scales higher than Cedar. And then uh, another underrated hero that I would recommend would be. Fighter Mile. So people actually don't know that her defense scales really, really, really high into her damage. So your so her attack is actually irrelevant, but her 
defense, if it's over 2,000, she will hit insane, insane, insane bits of damage. Like literally over 6K uh, S1 pop easily. And if you put Elbrus on her, like any AOE, attacker like Dizzy or even the new Bologna, you know, they're going to get two shot very, very easily. So that's just you know, another example of using you know, your brain to actually understand the hero and know the hero because many people will just build you know, full HP by the mile you know, and like, you know, not really worrying about defense because you know, they think, oh, okay, I have, the, I have the defense buff when she's attacked, so defense is irregular. Also, not many people know that her damage is basically 100% scaled off her defense. And if you break the 2,000, threshold she will do, she does insane amounts of damage with really really amazing survivability got it so you talked about heroes requiring high investment and molagoras are a very high investment when you look at teams when a beginner player is starting out because let's say so they're like all right julian listen man i i've watched all your content i've listened to everything you said you know i follow what you said i've got all my hunts done i'm at floor 11s I, I'm, I'm killing it i got hero selection and and now i kind of want to branch out do my own thing who are certain heroes that you would say when a when a player's branching out trying to establish themselves who are certain heroes that they should molagora or certain heroes that would take molagora priority Guild Wars is the currently you know, the most competitive part of the game. I still do right now. I only have a nine-man roster team for Guild Wars. And then my core team, they're all plus 15. And so for the beginner players or the people who are just starting out, I would pick six heroes that you would 100% invest in for your Guild War defense team and make them plus 15. Because I'm one of the few people in probably the entire game it uses the same offense as defense. No matter what hero pops up in Guild Wars, I kind of rely on outgearing them uh, and then also outplay the uh, AI system because the AI system is very is very easy to abuse because it's kind of like versing a six year old you know in the chess game. Right, you know what they're gonna do. Right, carefully planning out and always being two steps ahead of the AI, you'll win no matter what units you actually use so for example like i see a random team all right i'm just going to use rule uh moonlight can and carmen for anything and it will always win no matter what because you understand what's going to happen you understand what the computers do and regardless of what heroes you use i could switch it up as well i could just use you know crowd fike dizzy right i could use that team for almost every single offense regardless if they have a bike in or violet and still win because you can abuse the AI system. So back to that is you would I would pick you know six of your favorite heroes that you've heard good you know, reviews about. Six of those heroes fully you know invest in the Molagora and uh, invest in the gear and the time to know the heroes inside out because you know the game is a long term investment. There's, you're gonna have a lot of failures and stuff, but just don't give up because before I was like a tank and my defense in arena i was using terrible terrible things i remember when season one was ending i was using like normal kise with like ule carmen and then like uh what was it yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know i wasn't even using uh crimson arm i was using just normal arm with like ule and then like kise and like fire cam for like defense which was made no sense it was absolutely crap and then from failure you know i learned a lot of what i should do how do I do it? And then adapt. Got it. So with the new player, they should really, you know, take into consideration, like, again, laying the foundation, getting the gear, getting all the stuff that they need, and then really deciding upon a team based on their likes and their personal preference for playing. And then with everything we've talked about here today, that they should really get into learning what a hero's full potential is. So that way they can understand how to best use those heroes and those teams. Correct. And then just invest in them and then just trust yourself. You know, just because you have a bad week or two or you know, have a bad month or have a bad season doesn't mean you should just give up on your heroes. You know, just take the time, invest, and then slowly, slowly try to adapt because you know i i'm i still change my builds to this day slightly tweaking them because you know i see holes in my guild war defense i see holes in my arena defense 
and then I try to balance it out so that I can uh, win most of my battles without you know getting frustrated. So back to you know Dark Corvus, right? Everyone hates Dark Corvus. So if you can build a team that can make them time out, I promise you again, they will never attack you again. Never ever attack you again. <laughs> nice. Let's just piss off the enemy. <laughs> yeah, especially especially for um, especially for defense. And actually, the for the the week that mattered, the last week of um, arena, I actually mixed up my defense and threw a lot, a lot of people off. I actually used Rule Carmen with Fighter Maya and Fire Corpus. Interesting. So you see that? You see, like on paper, it's just like, what the hell is that? Yeah, that was my first Without, thought. Dark Corpus literally needs to use his S3 four times to kill my whole team. Will he survive that? Will he survive the time limit? And also, I, I rule it so that but the Dark Corvus, even with a Soul Burn, sometimes cannot one-shot it because of the Water Origin and the Crowd Defensive buff. So that just you know, really, really triggers people a lot. It makes them absolutely really, really upset. So Fire Corvus, you know, is really difficult to kill. You can bring you can bring a Lunar, which is fine, which is one of the hard counters of Fire Corvus. But the Crow, unless there's a fire unit which has no counter um, to my team at the moment, Crow is always going to provoke Lunar. So you're going to have a hard time killing Fire Corvus. And then with Dark Corvus, you would have to kill the Roulette first. If you don't kill the Roulette first, it's going to be res, res, res. And at the same time, you're going to worry about Crow S3. Whole time there's going to be S. 2 debuff, uh, S2 buff, and then you're just going to be really, really upset. And the Fighter Maya, of course, is like really hard to kill already by herself. You're just going to have a really, really bad time. Got it. And that ties into thinking about, you know, what the enemy's doing, thinking about what you're doing, and then playing every opportunity that you get to your advantage. Correct. And I kid you not, no one attacked me for the last 15 to 20 minutes. Wow. That's insane. Yeah, because when you when you mentioned that defense, I was like, what? I was like, yeah, Fire Corvus, okay, Ruel, okay. And then Fighter Maya, I was like, you know, the first person I thought of was Lindar. But even with your team, it was a little bit different. I'm like, you know, I'm curious to see how this works out. Now that you've explained it, now putting all the pieces together in my mind, that's something that could only be achieved, again, if you kind of use your brain and, and think about the full potential of your characters and how they work together. Correct. I mean, I like to share that to Lindar. She has the best Fighter Maya ever. No, she's um, absolutely the most wrecking ball fighter mile in the server, hands down. Like, she counters with a fighter mile with Elbrus and probably, like, hits, like, 6K or 7K. Easy. That's, yeah, that's that's crazy. I, I had the, I made the mistake of running into Lindar's team. So, Jolene, you, you mentioned really, like, finding your own play style. And you say that making, you know, making your own decisions and, and figuring things out on your own is really a, an important step of your player progression. Do you think that, you know, finding a good guild is part of that? I think finding a good guild is probably the most important thing to make your own decisions and to step up your gameplay. So take me for an example. Like, without ambition, honestly, I wouldn't be, you know, half as inspired or even half as good as, as I am right now. Because I was, when I went into the guild, you know, <clears throat> I was basically the lowest dog in ambition. The best thing about it was, you know, most people think, oh, because ambition is number one. We're like a really toxic guild, you know, full of elitist people. It's actually the complete opposite. In ambition, you probably have some of the most humble, nice players ever. Because it's a team game, a very supportive, everyone loves to help each other to become better. So, you know, I like to shout out to my guild leader, Vane, um, you know, giving me a lot of support, a lot of advice. A shout out to Rec, you know, helping me to be inspired, to be motivated. And also shout out to uh, another officer, Raven and Noreen, because, you know, they, they actually put a lot of effort into each guild wars, you know. When we burst really competitive guilds, the officers will pull all-nighters. They will stay up all night to make call outs, make judgments, make advice. So when you're in that type of you know, environment, it really, really motivates you. And if you do really badly, you know, it kind of makes you feel bad because you know, you're letting everyone down. Choosing the right guild you know, to support you through you know, your lowest times and your greatest achievements is possibly you know, the best thing um, about this game. 
to choose a guild, if it's competitive or non-competitive, the environment has to be the best. You know? Just like you go to work, you know, you want to have a nice environment with some nice colleagues. You don't want any assholes you know, to disrupt your thinking or your playing because, you know, it's just toxic toxicity is never a good thing. Always apply if you're interested in joint ambition because, you know, it doesn't mean you have the best gear, you know, then you get accepted. We're looking for like quality players, you know, who are nice people and then, you know, just want to have a good time and support each other. Got it. So, and the, for those players who, let's say, aren't at top or, you know, aren't strong enough yet to maybe, you know, be part of Ambition, you know, what are ways that they can improve or maybe find a temporary guild to become better? Yeah, so you know, there are plenty of guilds to choose from because right now the guild award system is very, you know, very, very generous. So a lot of the, you know, top guilds, they're in the top 50 range, all have very similar rewards. So I would just uh, recommend to be in a semi-competitive environment where you, know, you have some good players and you have some laid-back players. Ambition is, you know, like the end game, what you want to aim for at the end. Use that as the motivation, you know, take good advice from your guild. From that, just slowly build up good habits and, you know, and a positive attitude because it's always something to look forward to. It's like a motivation, it's a goal. Today, man, we've learned a ton from you you know we're sitting down we're breaking down defense players are learning how to really think for themselves and that the value in playing the game is really coming into kind of using your brain and thinking about more than just getting more stats you know not making the mistake of just running to simple cleaves and running teams that just everybody else is doing and really thinking about all the strategies that they could run based on the heroes that they enjoy so tell me julian if there was one thing that you would want to share with players? Let's say Epic 7 was going to disappear tomorrow, or let's say this is the last day you played Epic 7. What's one thing that you would want the player base to know so they can maximize their potential? So for me, you know, I think succeeding in life you know, is an important, crucial step. But in order to, you know, to be successful, you know, one has to fail many, many times. During the failures, you know, try to adapt, Try to learn. Don't always try to, you know, copy someone 100% because it's like saying, you know, I want to be second class rec. I want to be third class rec. Why do you want to be second class, third class when you can be first class of your own? If you make something special, you know, people will look up to you. And if it's successful, you know, people will try to copy you instead. So there's no point following the shadow of someone else. Try to be the best of yourself, positive attitude in a positive manner. Awesome, awesome, Julian. And I'm sure that's going to, you know, touch a lot of people's hearts because I know a lot of people out there, you know, are struggling with trying to, you know, find their own path. And I hope that the interview that we did with you today will help them find that. And before we bring this to a close, if people are looking to reach you or maybe ask you some questions, where can they find you? I think you can find me on the official, the official uh, Discord channel. I'm always there to help have a nice chat with anyone who wants to wants to ask some opinions or look forward to some questions and i'm always there to help awesome julian well listen man thank you so much for this opportunity you're going to help a ton of players really lock in and really start thinking about their defense and running their own team style in the way that they want thank you for having me and just you know enjoy the game have lots of fun you know don't be stressed out don't you know try to do something that you're not comfortable with just try to have fun just like in life in general, have fun, have a great time, and just enjoy yourself, enjoy the game. Don't be too hard on yourself, ever. And there you have it, guys. That concludes our interview with Julian Z. Shouts out again to Ambition for stepping up to the plate and, and being willing to get out there and help as many new players and players across the world as possible. Shouts out to Julian Z for doing this interview. This guy is an absolute beast. As I said before, he has literally one of the highest, if not the highest, defensive rates in top arena. So if you guys got any questions, comments, concerns, definitely let me know in the comment box below. You guys can find Julian Z in the official Epic 7 Discord where you can find him there. If you guys are interested in applying for Ambition, make sure you guys get in touch with Julian Zane and or Rec. And of course the officers that he mentioned in the video. And with that being said, we will see you guys in the next video. Peace.